May I request uh, uh, Professor Jodhka, Vice Chancellor Professor B.J. Rao, Professor Gansham Krishna, and Professor Srinivas Rao to come and occupy their seats on the dais, please. Vice Chancellor Professor B.J. Rao, Director, Institute of Eminence, Professor M. Gansham Krishna, Professor Surinder Jodhka, who is Professor of Sociology at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Professor V. Srinivas Rao, Head, Center for Regional Studies, students, colleagues, guests, ladies and gentlemen, like most human institutions, the School of Social Sciences has had a checkered history. But as it celebrates its golden jubilee year this year, I have no hesitation in saying that it has contributed immensely to the relevance, visibility, and credibility of this university in immeasurable ways. The credit for this goes to the students, the faculty, and the non-teaching staff who have contributed to its growth and nurtured it over the years. As we look to the years ahead, we do so possessed with the knowledge that we have furthered truth, decency, civility, courage, curiosity, intellectual rigor, and joy. And above all, we have learned and disseminated the lessons of modesty and persistent effort. This lecture series, then, is our way of rejoicing through dialogue, through conversations, through listening, and through honoring ideas. In putting together the Golden Jubilee events, we have had the enthusiastic support and encouragement of the Vice Chancellor. He often says that all things begin with social sciences and humanities and then move to the sciences. Uh, he, has, uh, he has actually made that possible. Uh, we express our sincere gratitude to him. Professor N. Gansham Krishna uh, has been a source of great strength and support and I thank him for all the support that you have given to the series and all other activities that we have come to you for. I have personally relied on the generosity, advice, and extraordinary work of my students, Prathvi, Satyaki, Changmong, Ganeshwar, Rajat, and many more. Thank you for being there. Members of my office have been a source of great strength. Thank you, Bhavani Garu, Meena Garu, Ashok Garu, Srinivas Garu. Every member of the administration at all levels in the university, whether it's the estate section or whoever it is, has joined us in this celebration and we are immensely thankful to them for making this possible. Um, I now request uh, Professor Gansham Krishna, um, the guest of honor, to say a few words. I'll say only a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Vice Chancellor Professor B.J. Rao, uh, Professor Sharma, Dean Social Science, Professor Jodhka from JNU, distinguished speaker for today, Professor Srinivas Rao. Uh, I see senior colleagues and students, friends. Uh, good afternoon to everyone again. Uh, I must first congratulate uh, uh, Professor Jyotimai Sharma for thinking of this uh, concept. Uh, I can tell you that there are many other units which have got inspired by this. And we'll have a series of uh, Golden Jubilee uh, lectures organized by various academic units. So I must congratulate you for thinking of this. And it is a, I think it's an extremely nice way of uh, 
academically celebrating a golden jubilee uh, instead of having you know dinners and lunches and uh, so on uh, many international conferences are being organized and uh, if i remember jnu celebrated uh, golden jubilee about a few years back but it was hit by covid i believe 2019 was uh, we are also very fortunate that we have uh, the uh, institution of eminence program going on which can facilitate uh, this celebration and uh, to bring eminent scholars like professor jodhkar to the university not just national but internationally eminent scholars Uh, to the university to be able to listen to them interact with them and learn from them is something that i think is a unique opportunity that we have we are very fortunate that we are in the middle of the uh, ioe program and the topics that have been selected by the school of social sciences are very uh, interesting uh, i hope to be able to attend all of them but uh, so uh with these few words i once again thank and congratulate professor jyotimesh sharma for the concept organizing the golden jubilee lecture series and i wish everyone a good time a good learning experience and uh as he said an enjoyable time thank you thank you so much professor ganjam krishna may i now request uh, vice chancellor professor b j rao to give his inaugural address and get this series started and going on its way professor rao firstly i really enjoy this hall although it is little you know small for today's audience because it's an academic setting it doesn't have bells and whistles and it has this inspiration secondly i see this hall full first time <laughs> you have actually beaten the best science seminars thirdly i want to thank uh, professor jyotka ji for sparing this time and sharing his ideas in the lecture to come it's going to be my last that i have to run away at 3 o'clock for something else but i am glad to be part of this inaugural session as a part of golden jubilee celebrations and i think this is the best part of ioe that we are doing golden jubilee lectures as a fertilization point of ideas inviting people best people and spending time together with them and today's topic has to deal with very important and very relevant issue for india that is the the village growth dynamics and how we have done how we have gone about it in some sense i am not paraphrasing the exact title but that's the spirit of it i i observe this society this world very keenly although i am a geneticist biologist by birth birth by training i am very very curious creature so in that curiosity the village as units of growth touches me very often and i can very clearly feel that in the flow of gdp centric growth we have almost completely ignored the villages so far villages i mean real villages as well as very small towns we have kept them aside we have concentrated on mega cities wealth few people generating wealth etc 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 so therefore a large chunk of india is still to be tapped and i'm sure this is what he will talk about now um, we are a very organic system we interconnect with one another in many many ways in fact the growth itself is an organic process so in that philosophy the entities which have been left behind have to be touched very significantly 
and there are very interesting new ways of actually doing very interesting things in rural and small cities now small towns because technology and uh, human activities have become so all pervasive that there are real models available for us to implement to really bring up all round growth growth quote and quote not necessarily gdp centric growth in the rural units in small cities etc etc and i think we have not even begun implementing that in some sense so there is a lot of work for us to do for us as academicians scholars thinkers and for those people who work on the ground and it is very important for us us sitting here to connect with the real growth engines of the system in whichever way we want to and i suppose these kind of dialogues discourses will will inspire us to get that connection done we have been largely living in our own utopian little bubbles so in whichever possible way possible we should be able to connect now to the real units of the growth to be able to feel intimately the journey of the growth it is possible so i think these are idea sessions please uh, applaud let's applaud the speaker and also let us let us applaud this heavy man sitting here the dean for bringing heavy speakers and really appreciate your efforts that you do so casually you bring in big people without efforts which is nice i welcome all of you here for being part of this celebration it is my loss that i have to run away after some time but enjoy the session and enjoy the celebration thank you very much thank you very much um, finally i'll have a nickname in the university <laughs> thank you for doing it um i now request uh, professor vishnu nivas rao to introduce professor jyotka and chair the session professor surender jyotka the speaker of today's school of social sciences institution of eminence golden jubilee distinguished lecture professor bj rao the vice chancellor professor gansham krishna the director ioe g do professor jyotirmaya sharma dean of the school colleagues students and friends a fabulous afternoon it's a privilege it is a privilege to introduce an eminent sociologist professor surender jodka professor jodka is currently with the center for the study of social systems school of social sciences jawaharlal nehru university professor jodka's research focuses on different dimensions of social inequalities and their reproduction processes the empirical focus of professor jodka's work has been social inequality cast in contemporary times rural society and agrarian changes development studies political sociology of social and cultural identities in contemporary india his recent publications to name a few include the indian village rural lives in the 21st century the oxford handbook of caste agrarian change in india india's villages in the 21st century revisits and revisions mapping the elite power privilege and inequality a handbook of rural india further it gives me an opportunity to introduce that professor jodka at the initial stage of his academic career was the faculty in the department of sociology in the, the university of hyderabad from 1991 to 98 then he moved to the department of sociology punjab university later in 2001 he joined the school of social sciences jawaharlal nehru university during his academic pursuit professor jodka associated with the Oxford University the University of Lord Sweden the University of Bergen Norway 
the University of Wisconsin Madison, National University of Singapore, the World Bank, etc. So with this brief introduction, I now invite Professor Jodka to deliver the School of Social Sciences, Institute of Eminence Golden Jubilee Distinguished Lecture on Revisiting the Village, Revisioning the Rural Specialities in 21st Century India for the next 40 to 45 minutes, followed by Q&A, 20 to 25 minutes. So with this brief introduction, I request Jodhika, please, sir. I'm not used to speaking in a very officious manner. I try to name everyone, Isi Rao, Sri Sham Krishna, Sharma, and to Hussein Vas Rao, uh, to say that uh, I'm feeling yeah, honored to be here will be an understatement. I'm honestly feeling pampered. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I mean, one feels pampered for various reasons, but I feel that it is still my home. Uh, so many people have come and of course, many of you don't know me, right? I mean, until 10 years back when I came here, I could recognize almost everyone and I could connect with them in a very different manner and in between pandemic and stuff like that, things changed. My memory of this room, unlike Professor Rao's memory, is that it has always been like this. <laughs> always used to be crowded. The last seminar I organized in this room was in 1998 and that was published later on as a book by Sage called Community and Identities that was also organized in this room. Later on also, I think when I published my book on caste in contemporary India, we had a book discussion here and at that time also I remember this room was packed almost like this, you know, I don't think it was any lesser than this. So for me, it is not a surprise. It's just kind of I connect with it much more intimately and much more personally. Thank you very much for giving me this honor. Thank you very much for treating me as somebody who is part of the I mean, family is a very odd word. I don't like using it in these institutional contexts because institutions have their own logic and they should keep that logic. But still kind of, you know, being owned by somebody being, you know, even this message of belonging is actually very overwhelming. I'm not, I'm not trying to be formal. Um, I think Professor Rao very rightly mentioned that this is idea session. And uh, when you are thinking of something like village, uh, my own experience is that nobody wants to talk about something that will irritate you perhaps, will make you angry or will at least make you a bit agitated or at least make you think a little more so that we will kind of remember something from this lecture. So I am not going to make a kind of empirical presentation even though I am known to do empirical work and, and people say theory and Suridha Jyotka they don't go together. It's a conceptual kind of text. I am obviously not a theoretician. I don't aspire to be. I don't think we should worry about theories much. But at the same time I think we should we should think conceptually and this kind of is, is a kind of conceptual effort uh, but in a very different different tone, very different from the way most people do. Uh, so the past 35 years or so, when I was thinking about it and I wrote 35 years, then I looked myself in the mirror, I must be old now. And I think I'm not old, I'm still young. So I plan to do many more field studies and, and many more lectures. So I started my field work in Haryana in the late 1980s, to be precise, when I went to villages of Haryana to do field work for my PhD. And after that, I've continued in that region, I've revisited some of those villages. Uh, I've also studied with Punjab empirically. I did a survey of 51 villages. Then we did a study of uh, of six villages and then also kind of historically I've been working on. I did some work on Gujarat, which was not published before I joined the University of Hyderabad. I was in Surat for 11 months where I did some work in Baruch district. And uh, that kind of, you know, also stays in my mind. I did some field work in Himachal Pradesh, which was on, on published in EPW, Cast on the Hill. And I've also done work in, in Madhubani district of Bihar. So these are kind of different varieties of mostly north, northwest, northeast India, not east actually, Bihar would be still uh, northern India. But I have obviously lived in Hyderabad, I have reasons to travel around in, in south India. So <clears throat> it's on the basis of that that I, I try to kind of develop my ideas. 
and uh, uh, motivation for doing this also comes from uh, from the recent happenings in, in, in India, uh, particularly the farmers movement in, in, in 2020 and the manner in which uh, we middle class Indians, I think all of us are middle class whether you call yourself middle class or not, but we are urban middle class Indians. The way middle class Indians in Delhi, near Delhi, engage with those issues and I kind of, you know, my this new book which I'll introduce briefly, I talk about uh, what I describe as the cosmopolitan Kisan, right? how middle class was speaking about these movements in a very kind of uh, uh, ignorant and arrogant manner. I try to kind of put these two words together and the two normally go together. So the ignorance and the arrogance kind of without really looking at what was the grouse of the farmers and what were farm laws, they knew everything. So it was a judgmental language without any engagement with, with those realities. While when I went to the farmers movement, even virtually when you look at those programs, they were actually very knowledgeable people. And they were constantly talking about why were they protesting, what were the issues and what kind of questions through which one should look at agriculture. They were talking about farm laws, they had some young people, lawyer, their own family members who were coming and giving them lectures that how these acts were passed under uh, trade acts, not agriculture, because agriculture is a state subject. And otherwise also, I mean, doing your field work, I remember in villages of Madhubani, you start talking to like, an agricultural laborer and suddenly you realize you're talking to a philosopher. And I'm not joking, they, they, they actually have very, very, uh, because they are migrants, they have traveled, they have come back, they have seen the world, they have their history like everyone else has. So I think uh, that in some sense, and, and this goes back to my first field work. My first shock was when I was doing my field work in Haryana, and I was speaking to this Dalit uh, landless laborer who had retired, and he was like nearly 75, 80 years, and I had a long interview with him, and he made so much fun of me. Every time I asked a question, he would, he would start laughing. He says, you know nothing, right? And I actually knew nothing. He gave me, he gave me. And uh, likewise, if you speak to an attached laborer, and suddenly after some time you wonder whether it is kind of class on Karl Marx or, or an agricultural laborer speaking and he would actually calculate his exploitation in terms of number of hours work, value added and how much he gets. I'm not, I'm not joking. So I think uh, later on when I began to teach sociology, there was this term used by Anthony Gillen that we are knowledgeable subjects. So every person is knowledgeable about herself, about the context in which she or he is growing up. And this is how I think one needs to kind of break away from, from middle class context and start talking about, about, about rural or village from a more kind of, you know, uh, uh, in some sense, as a social scientist who's trying to engage with reality. Teaching also helps, I think, scholarship engagement with, with, with other people. <coughs> um, these books were already mentioned, but these are some of the books which kind of uh, bring together some of the work. Uh, they are representative also. If you look at the first book, Handbook of Rural India, it has a section on village studies, which I'll talk about in briefly, uh, which were first published in Economic Weekly in 1950s. They are all put together in this. Uh, so in 1955, Emman Shirinvas published a book called India's Villages. So this was an edited volume of anthropological studies. And I was kind of helping EPW edit its uh, review of rural affairs. And at that time, there was also a project that we had undertaken, uh, some other people had undertaken in England, where they were re revisiting the villages that British anthropologists had studied in 1950s. So I think, along with Edward Simpton, who was, who was the director of this program, we put together this book that village is still around. And all these essays, which were included in this book, it's quite a thick book, they were also empirical studies of those villages. Some cases it was new village, but in many cases they were also revisits. The third book that is mentioned here, it just came out in September 2023 and this in some sense tries to introduce the idea of village, the kind of things that I am going to talk about uh, also conceptually but also empirically, the trajectory of rural life over the past uh, 200 years I would say as I said. Uh, the idea of, uh, 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 since my title it is, is revisiting the village, revisioning the rural, I'll just briefly give you this idea of village studies for those who have kind of no familiarity with, with the history of sociology as a discipline. So uh, in 1950s and 60s, uh, it was in some sense the beginning of empirical social science in India. You had some kind of surveys being done by colonial rulers, historians had written, or you have conceptions about Indian society. 
notions about Indian society. In the 1950s, we have development of social sciences when planning commission in some sense begins to start planning for India, but they don't know what so-called unplanned or undeveloped India is. And that's why there is this kind of demand for village studies that you should actually go and look at what India is like on ground. And this was in some sense a very important shift from what M. M. Srinivas rightly called as the book view of India, which was based on readings of certain kind of classical texts, which was popularized by Indology and Orientalists and colonial rulers, also developed their understanding of India, which was textually conveyed on the basis of those readings to something which was supposed to be learned from the field by talking to people, by observing, by looking at institutions, by kind of, you know, actually engaging with the, with the ground realities and unearthing what was there in their mind and how institutions had evolved. So these were village studies which were supposed to empirically inform people and not, not create a kind of imagination of India which was, which was textual and as Shirin was very rightly said, the textual was also Brahmanical understanding of India because the moment we think about textual, you would go to Sanskritic texts of certain kind which are produced by certain kind of people or individuals at certain, certain moment in time. So it was not like, you know, these were unbiased uh, readings of, of rural life. So the entire understanding of India, which was popular with nationalist leaders, in some sense it still continues with us, is drawn from certain kind of scriptural sources or other kind of ancient texts. And the Britishers also were very happy to read those texts and say that Indian practice sati and then generalize that every Indian practice is sati. And these are things that historians pointed out that this was empirically not the case. Actually, the question of sati is far more complex. So, but anthropologists have written this piece uh, which came out long time back in 1998 that they work with the idea of village as they received it. So, it's not like a uh, village was reality as such, right? So they also had a notion of village. And that notion of village was actually their notion of India. So in the 1950s, the understanding was that India lives in its villages, right? All of us also still think that India used to live in its villages. Now some of us live in towns and cities and some still live in villages. But this itself is, is, is a notion and I'll come to it why and where it comes from. And then these anthropologists in some sense thought that village was a microcosm of India. It was like a case study. Like in biological sciences, you don't need to study every person's biological system. If you study even a rat, you would find out a lot about the human biological systems. Or if you kind of study a few case studies, you could perhaps generalize that if you give this medicine, it would work on cancer. You don't exceptionalize every case. Likewise, village was a microcosm of India. So if you study one village in, 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 in Telangana, and that would tell you everything about Telangana. Only thing you need to do is to, to study it very intensely, stay there for two years, one year, one and a half year, engage with them, become like them, one. And this method had been specialized by anthropologists in Africa. So that method was brought here. So, uh, but at the same time, there was an underlying assumption and which continues today. That's why people like me need to speak about it. It really was a kind of traditional community and the word traditional community has a specific meaning it was a cultural unit which had been stable and it had its own structure. Structure in the sense there was a there was this pattern in which it is organized. Caste was obviously very central to it, but caste also was understood in kind of very uh, Brahmanical sense as a structure of hierarchy with, with, with kind of Varna, Varna system or a Jajmani system, which again has as a notion of structure. Now, very interestingly, in 1950s, somebody like S.C. Dube, who was an anthropologist, very learned anthropologist, he comes and studies a village near Hyderabad city, right? And he never thought Hyderabad was India, right? So they always thought that village was India. So from the anthropological imaginations or even otherwise social sciences, even economists, there is no reference to the city life, right? Cities were part of India and villages and cities were connected, but uh, it was it was in some sense seen as not being Indian. Now, Hyderabad was not not Indian, right? You could say Calcutta and Bombay perhaps were colonial cities, but not Hyderabad. But the Asi Dube goes and stays in that village. What was the name of that village? Yeah. Shamir Pet. Now, Shamir Pet is part of Hyderabad, I suppose. Right? Shamir Pet was studied and celebrated as, as, as the Indian village where India lives. And closer to that, you know, this sketchy Bauli and, and the old city, all that was not India, right? So the city was absent in that imagination and it was not, it was not an accident. 
there was a reason why city was absent and then obviously as i said this method was specialized by anthropologists in africa what we call as ethnographic method and ethnographic method means that you become part of the ethnic the culture your own mind and that's how you would uh, would study so lots of people did that interestingly there is also this tradition of what we call as village revisits right revisit is a word popularized by economists now before sociologists started studying villages and along with sociologists there were also some economists who studied rural life and they did what we call as surveys of the village life and there was uh, an economist a uh, british economist uh, uh, near madras who studied villages there is famous village called palanpur likewise there were other uh, another tamil nadu village so there were several villages which had been studied by economists and they went back to those villages and their idea was that if you go and revisit the same place you would know how much has developed who has developed who has not developed right so the idea was that 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 that, that there is kind of as i said stable stagnant insulated village from outside world which is trying to change now there are state policies and economic growth is happening but we need to empirically know not from the data collected by nsso or census but also go there and study for anthropologists again it was very similar at some level taking stock of what had happened to the authentic traditional life has it changed or or how much has it changed in what direction is it going so underlying assumption was that the world moves in a particular direction what we call as linear progression linear progress and this is also something which is which is required which is inevitable which would happen right so <clears throat> so village as such has no future it should have no future its economy its social structure and everything else ought to change so there was a particular kind of value judgment that village is village is is like a child right like child grows up right? you, you you measure weight of child after 5 years doctors would also measure uh, the height and then they would also predict where is it going where the child is going so village was was seen as 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 if village is an infant uh, infant uh, village is a, is a village is a child and gradually it has to grow out of it so there is no future for village so this is a kind of imperative of change which is taken for granted uh <clears throat> my argument in this book the last book that i have published is that this was this was a mistaken understanding to begin with if i have to kind of pass a judgment but more importantly it is also a political move it is a political move where villages begins to be constructed in a particular way and there is a kind of making of national common sense and i dare i say if we were to innocently all of us including me what to talk about it will end up saying more or less the same things that people thought in 1950s and uh, so there is a kind of national common sense which comes into being i use the word 200 years you can use the call you can you can make it 100 years if you look at uh, uh, the history of india and i'm not a historian but i've read a little bit of history here and there in the 18th 19th century before britishers established the rule here if you look at the, the demographic composition of social life uh, uh, in terms of spatial categories rural urban is a convenient way of classifying india was more urban than europe was india estimates vary but ncert book one somewhere says that in the 18th century 1750 to 17% indians lived in urban centers of whatever kind and they were involved in urban business urban life they were they were princely state they were they were they were, they were, they were kind of ruling uh, places like hyderabad they were pilgrimage centers all kinds of urban sector and you can just any region wherever you come from starting with hyderabad and you just look around within 100 years of periphery you'll find at least 10 15 20 30 40 cities cities or towns or urban centers which have been around for ages not like they are recent so a uh, city and village have always been integrated my own estimate is that the urban life urban population in india even in the beginning of 19th century was much larger than the total population of great britain if you were to actually demographic classify demographically classify populations so city and village have always been integrated and they have been part of same economy and come to this point which later uh how does it come to be and and i use the word hegemony right village for me is a social construct 
village for me is also an ideological construct. And those who are kind of not familiar with the word ideology, the moment we use the word ideology, we, we attribute kind of intention to it. Ideology is something where you motivate people to think in a particular manner, act in a particular manner. It's not simply a set of ideas. Hegemonic is something which you you consent to. You, you recognize that yes, yes, women should be should be beaten up. Like you have these surveys that say that you know most of Indian women would say domestic violence is fine. That's a good example of hegemonic consent that even women give to. So there is this like village city division is both ideological, also hegemonic, but more importantly, the idea of Indian village is constructed as an ideological uh, reality and it's also hegemonic in the sense that even villagers subscribe to it. And this starts with, as I said, 200 years, McCarthy's famous uh, uh, statement on India being a land of village republics. And he was not the only one, an entire kind of uh, breed of colonial and orientalist writers talked about village as, as a central category, as a foundational unit, village, caste, Hinduism, etc., etc. So colonial uh, administrators knew about India, they knew about Hyderabad, they knew about every other uh, cities, they knew about village not being a land of, which is which was stagnant, but they popularized this idea that Indian villages, each village was a republic. As a republic, it was independent, it has its own economy, it had its own social life, it had kind of stayed independently of political processes, nothing could influence village life. Even if you destroyed the village, it would spring up again, but exactly in the same manner. Somebody like Karl Marx bought this, this, this idea and he said that you know British rule is good for India, that it would for the first time kill India, India's village, its social and cultural equilibrium. And then India will be able to move on the path of progress. This is precisely what they wanted to convey. Why the Britishers were doing this? They were doing it because uh, this is something that Bernard wanted. I'm not saying that that, that it was to to provide a justification of their presence in India to their own people in England, where there was democratic revolution happening, and they were asking them question: Why are we colonizing India? Why are we there? We are talking about democracy here. Why colonial rule there? We are there because they need us. It was classical idea of white man's burden, which was being propagated. But this Western ideas have not gone away. They have stayed with us. And my argument is that this Western colonial orientalist imagination of India is transformed by the nationalist leadership into what I call as the national common sense. There is something called Indian national common sense to which all of us subscribe. And the reason for this is that, you know, the nationalist middle class is educated in English medium schools. These are English uh, institutions locally and the West and they come to learn about India through those texts. Somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he invokes the idea of village for the first time, Indian village in South Africa. And I've written a separate paper on this, this is also a chapter in my book. In South Africa, he invokes the idea of Indian village as, as a republic to argue, to make a claim that we are not like blacks. It's actually a very vicious argument and tells the white rulers that you should treat Indians differently. Don't treat us at par with par with, uh, with, 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 with black people. He was doing it innocently. He thought this is what India was. I'm not, I'm not attributing any vicious motive to him, but that's how it was, it was argued. So uh, nationalists and all of us included in that sense, the Indian middle classes found this idea useful at some level. That, that you think of India through certain foundational categories, that there is something which brings us together. There is one similar imagination of India and this similar imagination could be best captured through ideas of caste, ideas of village, ideas of Hinduism. And if these three categories in some sense are what India is. If you look at the writings of Gandhi and Nehru, we think they are very different on the question of village and caste to some extent. They are actually very similar. It's just that they are two different sides of the same coin. One is taking a traditionalist position, to put it simply. The other one is taking a modernist position. He is not denying, Nehru is not denying that the traditional picture doesn't exist. Yes, India was a land of what he writes in his, uh, I think, uh, discovery of India, of, 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 of uh, uh, caste, uh, three things, joint family, and living in community. These are three features of the traditional Indian society 
they must change. So obviously Nehru is a developmentalist, a progressive scientific uh, way of thinking. And Gandhi thinks that, yeah, this is where we can actually make an argument for India's independence because village is authentic, village is, is a different kind of life. And obviously they are, Gandhi's ideas are very sophisticated and they, they evolve over time. But at the same time, in the process, he propagates this idea. More than anyone else, Gandhi has been the one who has actually been the ideologue of village in some sense. That we need to, we need to recover ourselves by recovering our villageness, recovering our village as a, as a special unit. And that's where we should try to become modern. Gandhi becomes later on very modernist. He says there should be post office. The real village is very dirty. We should have clean. He is very upset when untouchability is practiced. He is also perhaps trying to use the idea of village as India to kind of, he figures out all those people who are fighting with him for nationalist movement, they are all uh, urban uh, and they know nothing about India and that was villages and that's how he tried to in some sense propagate the idea of village. So they, they actually, when they encounter empirical village, their ideas, imagination change, but they actually remain in some sense, conceptually committed to the idea of idea of village. And yeah, even Ambedkar, it's very interesting, you know, I've looked at Ambedkar's idea of village. Ambedkar was perhaps more, much more empirical and much more critical than Gandhi and, 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 and Arun. And he, as we all know, very actively abused the idea of village. Uh, and, and But he is also, at some level, is looking at the village in more or less in the same manner. For him, the Indian village is the Hindu village, right? As if there are no other villages in India. There are fishery villages, there are villages where Hindus don't live, right? So he, in some sense, also generalized India as land of villages and every village is a Hindu village. And Hindu village means Brahminical Hindu village in a particular manner. And even when he talks about urban, it's quite misplaced. He, we all think that, you know, he directed all the Dalits to move out of city. But his own poor chap's experience of city was very bad. And when he writes his essay, his, his list of the small book on, on, on his own personal experiences waiting for visa, the first essay is about Baroda and the kind of violence he encounters because he's immediately identified as Dalit. So at some level, you know, uh, Ambedkar is also located in the same uh, uh, kind of uh, historical uh, kind of imagination of India. Uh, so, uh, it's not just an Indian reality, I think. That's why this has become common sense because it's also embedded in our social sciences, our imagination about the world and social change and theories of social change and the kind of spatial structures exist in the world. So, village begins to be seen as what Imai Durkheim call as sui generis and we in social sciences make a distinction between reality as socially constructed and reality as being sui generis, that it's out there. So, so Durkheim's idea of sweet energy applies to this distinction between rural and urban sociology and uh, they in some sense begin to then also visualize the world living in these two kinds of special locations and where village is one type of society, uh, 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 city is another kind of society and this is also the moment, you know, colonialism is not something which is isolated from the modern world, right? the modern world is constituted by colonial realities. And colonial realities also shape Western social science theories, which we still teach in universities. And our imagination of the world, in some sense, is also shaped by, by that specific imagination of the world, which is Western imagination of the world about itself and about the other as, quote unquote, the reality of the world. So theories, languages, categories of Western modernity remain the textbook language of social sciences and theories of development and economic growth are the best example of that. The moment we think about development economists who teach development studies, they in some sense completely erase out the reality of colonial plunder. The fact that Europe became developed, the West became developed because they plundered us, they underdeveloped India, right? We were talking about 17% uh, India being urban in the, in the early 19th century. India gets ruralized by early 20th century. Only 10% of India is, is urban. India is not urbanized by the British, and this is a critical fact. I'm not, I'm not making it up. So during the British period, there is de-industrialization of India. There is ruralization, de-urbanization of India. And uh, so I have very little time. So eventually what we have is this imagination which we find in textbooks, which we which we also think when we are talking to each other, which is there in policy documents, which is there in in 
global visions like billing is traditional, simple, backward, homogeneous, poor, conservative, also authentic, right? We have kind of, you know, say that your villagers know what real is. City is contrast, the binary of village, modern, complex, advanced, diverse, wealthy, forward looking, but also inauthentic. So there's a kind of positive and negative, but all that in some sense feeds each other. So such a framing presupposes almost everything. So this is not simply a conceptual move. You're not classifying uh, genes or something else. This is actually superimposing a judgment on a reality which is far more complex and also in the process we try to kind of simplify and this judgment in some sense is not simply a kind of judgment without implications. It has significant implications for the way world gets to organize. So this binary view gets institutionalized and it persists because in some sense the colonial categories are turned into national common sense and then they are also inserted into social science theories but it's also institutionalized in state practices like demographics as we know, uh, classification of populations into, into rural and urban and it's also a kind of uh, the idea is to think of humanity in, 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 in kind of global normatives like you have United Nations and these global normatives are, are also framing what is good life, what is developed life, you know, the very idea of education. We, nobody would say education is a bad thing. It isn't a bad thing. Obviously, we are a university. How can we say education is a bad thing? But this particular kind of education is seen as education, right? Uh, Bhagat Kabir is somebody, if there are people in Hindi literature, they would have done PhD on Kabir. But Kabir was not educated in the sense in which the University of Hyderabad did give him a degree, right? He gave degrees uh, on, or to people who have done PhD on Kabir, but Kabir was educated. Of course, everyone was educated in some way or the other. So there is a kind of global normative of, of, of how political communities should be organized, what citizenship is, which is embedded in this idea of good life and development. I'm not against it, by the way. I'm not traditionalist, but I think we need to critically engage with this reality. So what is at stake? Why are we why are we creating this ruckus? Uh, so there is a kind of West-centric modernist framing of change are teleological in nature. They tend to imagine the world through linear evolutionary binaries that presuppose what exists and what could be possible. Right? I think this is very important. What could be possible? We could have other possibilities, but the only possibilities that we have is to urbanize. The only possibility as we have is to is to industrialize. India is not industrializing in the manner in which West industrialized itself. That moment is gone. We are in a different moment, but we still keep thinking about a particular linear way. If that is not happening, then that is not progress, that is not change. So, in some sense, the future of village also gets, gets predestined. Villagers have no agency of its, itself. And such binary constructs tend to be a historic. They tend to erase histories of colonial plunder. How did West come to be developed modern urban? is not really talked about in this conceptualization. They are completely ignorant of local histories and social sciences become mere advocates of Western style modernity. And this is something that, that all of us in some sense begin to preach in some sense. A lot of social science, I should not say it in presence of Vice Chancellor <laughs> and Dean together. Right? So, <coughs> so uh, and this is where I'm going to show you some empirical material. So empirical trajectories of change are very complex, right? City grow, but rural also persists, right? Cities are not, it's not like urbanization is not happening. So there are a wide range of rural questions, old and new, which continue to persist. And there are also a wide range of urban questions. One should not think of urban as, as not being problematic. Just these two tables, I think I should show you the other one first. Yeah. So this is a global kind of, um, I have data in my book from 1901, but I think this is kind of good enough. So if you look at this line, in 1960s, there are around a billion people living in urban areas and there is obviously a kind of secular trend of urbanization and now there are perhaps, you know, 4.5 or more than 4.5 million people living in urban areas. There were 2 billion people living in rural areas. Now, it's only in 2008, 7 or 8, that globally speaking, urban population is more than rural population. Okay, fine, there is process of urbanization. Again, it's a question of classification. But if you look at this trend, 
between 2007 and 2020, rural population is still growing. So the absolute number of rural population continues to be very large and it is larger than ever before. Right? Larger than ever before in the history of, of humanity, more people in the world live in rural areas than they have ever lived. The number is lesser than urban, but again, as I said, this is a matter of classification. Uh, many other things can be done. India is even more interesting, right? I have this table from 1901 to 2011. We don't have data for 2021, but it's not going to be any different. You know, trend will be more or less similar. So we had, as I said, 10 percent, 11 percent urban population, 1,827 urban centers, and now we have 31. It would be 34 or 35 percent of of India being urban. And it's a significant increase. And if you look at the total urban population from, say, uh, 26 millions, it's now 400 million. Now, 400 million Indians live in urban centers. Now, 400 million is a population larger than population of any other country of the world except for China and India. So, Indian urban population is very large. Right? It's already in some sense, you know, larger than the United States of America, which is the third largest country of the world, right? But come to the rural population, rural population is obviously declining from 89% to now it will be around 65%. But if you look at the absolute size of rural population, it's four times more than what it was. And it has never declined, right? Now, 900 million Indians live in rural areas, 900 million. At the end of the day, absolute numbers are the ones that matter. There is one person dying of hunger is one person. You can't reduce him to percentage. If one person is malnutrition, you can't reduce her to percentage. Right? One person is also real. Right? But you have 900 million living in villages, rural areas as they are classified by. So, and that it doesn't stop at numbers. Uh, <clears throat> we also have other kind of realities which I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. I'll try to wind up another five, six minutes. So that's where uh, my second part of the, 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 the presentation. Yeah, this one more thing I wanted to show you. This is very interesting because I'll show you. Yeah, so number of urban settlements goes up from less than 2,000 to nearly 8,000, right? Rural settlements haven't gone down. So the general narrative that we hear from demographers is that many of the villages are becoming towns because they grow in size, which is true. If you look at these numbers of 8,000 urban centers, 80% would be villages that have become bigger. So the point is that even today, new rural settlements are coming up. Right? So villages have not, not only not stopped declining, they are also new villages are emerging, right? Like new cities are emerging occasionally, perhaps more villages are emerging. So there are more villages today than there have ever been before in India's history. So is there another way of thinking about specialities which would take these complexities into account and then we would not have the kind of problem that Vice Chancellor was talking about how villages get marginalized not only in, in our imagination but also in reality, right? I think that's, that's, that's where we need to reimagine Specialities. You know, speciality means not that spatial formations don't exist. I mean, village is different from city. City is different from town. Hyderabad is different from Lingampal. Lingampal is different from Nizamabad. Nizamabad is different from a village uh, in, 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 in Andhra region, or a village of Andhra region is different from a village in Kerala. Right? Kerala villages are very different from from rural settlements in in, in Bihar. Right? Himachal Pradesh has rural settlements of like very small. 20, 30, 50 households. Bihar has villages of 30,000 population, right? So, spatial formations also shape us. Spatial realities are identities and they continue to be our identities and they are different identities. Life in old city is very different from life in the University of Hyderabad. Life in Hyderabad is different from life in a village of, 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 of coastal region or whatever. But if you look at historically speaking, villages and cities have co evolved. If we go back to the ancient civilization narrative of India, we talk about Harappa and Mohenjo-daro as urban civilization, right? And anybody will, will, will say that, yeah, the moment you have settled agriculture, there would be an elite and elite would want to live away from, from the land they, 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 they rule over. So they extract land revenue and that has been the history of the world. 
That's why Britishers came and settled here. That's why India was land of riches. They came here because because we were we were producing a lot of interesting stuff which had demand across uh, elites in the world, and that's why they came here. So the moment agriculture develops, villages, uh, urban centers also develop. Right? So cities are not modern. Villages are not traditional. Village and city co-evolve historically speaking. Any region of the world, right? So there are no universal patterns of spatial evolution. Right? If you think there is a particular manner in which the world is urbanizing, as I said, the patterns of the world and patterns of India are at difference. If we were to compare Western Europe and India, it would be even much bigger contrast. In Western Europe, you don't really have those kinds of rurality's. But only in Western Europe and North America, rest of the world, even in Western Europe, you'll find uh, countries where you would have rural settlements and people are still living in, in villages. So they are shaped through human agency and economic contingency. Right? I think uh, this is uh, something that economists are talking about. Uh, rural population has increased in the last five years. Uh, rural incomes, rural wages are declining. Last, you know, one week I've read several pieces by economists and I think there's also a report by some agency of government or some private agency which shows that rural villages have either stagnated or declined. They're declining because post-pandemic lots of people who are working in cities have gone back and they're not willing to leave the villages. So there's more supply of labor or otherwise there are some other factors. So but there are more people, workers living in villages than they were doing five years back before pandemic, right? Uh, so there are no universal pattern. I was in the uh, in, in, in US, uh, this place, uh, North Carolina. Uh, Vincent Salem, and this is a small town. And people were telling me that people are moving from New York to Vincent Salem because with online uh, business, it has become possible to live even in villages. I know people in, in, in daily buying land, land in, in rural areas of, of, of Madhya Pradesh and planning to shift there, that they can anyway have their office in a village. Why should they need to live in cities? So there is no one single evolutionary trajectories, uh, and, 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 and these processes are also shaped by by local ecologies, political histories, and global capital processes. And I think that's where we need to think of rural and urban not as essentialized spatial formations, but like we think of labor otherwise, like the economists think of labor or agriculture these days, food, they would not think of food simply as a, as a, as a rural phenomenon. So there's a whole global capital economy processes which shape, there are political histories, political histories have shaped, for example, Indian middle classes. Indian middle classes have a specific sense of themselves in relation to people living in villages and other middle classes don't have. So political histories in some sense make our identities, they also make our psychologies and there are also, ecologies become very important. When I was doing my field work in Himachal Pradesh, we went to this interior place called Kinnor, from where you get nice apples. Kinnor headquarter is a village panchayat, right? It's a district headquarter and there are many district headquarters which are village panchayats because of the ecological uh, kind of uh, realities. Likewise, those who know Kerala, they would know how uh, rural settlements are spread out in Kerala and they're very different from maybe Tamil Nadu or even within Kerala. But at the same time, pattern of spatial formations are not random. It's not saying that you should give up the idea of rural and urban or the idea of spatiality. They are structurally and functionally integrated and differentiated through logic of power and economy, which is the larger political economy that I was understanding. So our questions have to be questions of political economy, questions of, of politics and economy if we want to talk about village and city, not think through these evolutionary uh, uh, narratives of, 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 of imperatives of change which would, which would take it a particular manner. They are also shaped by other dynamics, caste, class, community, religious, ethnic. These are very important processes. Religion is not simply a question of faith. Religion also is, is, a, is a process of mobilization. Religion is also a process of living together with other people. And, and even in Hyderabad, anyone working on Hyderabad, religion is a very important process which shapes urban neighborhoods, which shapes urban, urban, urban economies, urban life. Likewise, caste and class obviously are a very, very important factor. Right? We think of caste as something which which is rural, which is kind of backward, which is, it is historically speaking, and I have mentioned it as well, caste, the way we understand it today, is an urban phenomenon. It is in the city that caste is mobilized. 
casteism has always been an urban reality not a rural reality casteism the fountain head of casteism is city it starts with the formation of caste associations in the late 19th century and all this was urban it's only when castes become to urbanize that they need to what chinwas calls it it's a historically consolidated themselves entire caste leadership is urban wherever you go whichever region you go uh, lalu prasad yadav becomes lalu prasad yadav when he comes to patna right mayavati becomes mayavati because she is growing up in in delhi and she is kind of preparing for upsc kashi ram is born in a, in a village of of punjab but then he becomes kashi ram in pune right likewise the brahmin association the brahmin mahasabha all these would have urban centers so complete I mean, the moment we think about caste, we think of village. Caste is an urban reality. Today's casteism is 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 actually articulated, mobilized, imagined, worked out, used politically in the urban context. So, <clears throat> this is one of my last slides. Uh, <clears throat> so, as is the case with urban, rural is also differentiated. We have this very Kind of popular category called peasant society. We start with that. Even now, we think of rural as being land of agriculture, and anyone who practices agriculture is a peasant. Right? It's a very problematic category. We never had peasantry, to be honest. You know, as as far as I understand, we India has always had what I call as caste agrarians. In some pockets, we might have had some kind of peasantry, but we have always had differentiated rules. The idea of peasantry was popularized in India by by Marxist economists and historians. because there was word peasant used by lenin and, and and marx in the european context <laughs> european rural settlements were settlements of peasants right they did not have caste system of the kind we have so rural in india has always been internally diverse and differentiated and it has actually become much more diverse and differentiated anyone who works in rural areas not more than 25% to 30% rural household full time engage in agriculture they never did more than 40 45 50% 50%. in some areas in madhubani villages where i did my field work which has only 6% urban population only 6% in madhubani villages only 11% rural household depended exclusively on agriculture rest of them had some land but they were poorly active they also had to had to kind of grow their uh, get their incomes from other sources remittances uh, 75% household had at least one person working outside outside doesn't mean that the person is migrating to the city the person is just working away and comes back like we saw in pandemic they went back to quote unquote their homes uh so in india rural for a dalit of some category is very different from a dalit of another category rural in india for an obc of one category is very different from the obc of another category rural in india for a dominant caste big landlord is very different experiential right so like cities are differentiated rural india has also been differentiated horizontally also from one region to the other as i said in kerala you don't have you did not have the kind of villages that we think of you know shamir pet or any other typical indian villages we talk about they were contiguous uh, homesteads right and you have this pattern in some other regions as well uh, south gujarat as i said earlier maharashtra sorry uh, uh, himachal village is very different from 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 villages of of, of bihar i remember we were doing field work in solan and this chap who was sarpanch of the village and i was having a long interview and after that he said chaliye aapko hamara constituency dikhate hain so i said what do you mean by constituency or sarpanch of a village he said no no i'll show you my constituency please come with me there were 50 settlements in his one panchayat constituency and in madhubani villages there were three panchayats in one village right so villages are very different and also ecologies would matter if you have rice production you have particular kind of settlement you have coconut <laughs> economy you have different kind of settlement you have horticulture you have other kind of ecological processes floods you have certain kind of you know rural lives and and these differences persist even today it's not like in the early 19th century these differences existed they don't do any longer in some sense these differences have become much more marked but they are obviously very different kinds so uh <clears throat> so there are they are also agential that's why i'm saying it's not a sui generis category these special formations are produced and made by by human action it could also be state policy it could also be 
some other global processes. It's not simply like, like cities are produced through global processes. So we need to kind of move away from the notions, right? And notions are hegemonic. Notions are ideological. They make us feel good. Urban elite was very happy to have this binary of village and city because urban elite, because she or he, mostly he, is educated in English, he already knows what is the future of the village. He already knows what is good for village. You don't need to ask the villager, right? You don't need to check with them whether you like these policies or not. So this is where, you know, the narrative then begins a kind of, you know, naturalized uh, wisdom. And that naturalized wisdom is actually, in some sense, uh, coming from uh, somewhere which is historically produced. As I was saying earlier, the caste is a very good example. And I've been working on caste. And some of us have been working on caste. All these identity movements, whether you take tribal movements or caste movements or religious movements, all these identity politics is actually urban middle class generated ideology. Not that it doesn't have realities or followings in villages, but I think uh, the, the, the binary construct, which in some sense thinks of urban as secular, as individualized, as liberated from all these identities and descriptions, is completely misplaced. And this is where the, 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 the final theme is that we should move away from notions to the empirics and those empirics for are there for us to examine that's why we continue to have the need for going to the village and studying realities as we do anything else and rural continues to be very very big in India and it's still you know more than twice if not three times of the size of the urban and we also need to perhaps also have more innovative notions of spatial classification then the binary of rural and urban, which in some sense already conveys a certain kind of meaning and certain kind of hegemonic effects. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, sir. I thank uh, Professor Jodhka for a very relevant lecture. Madam, madam. Yes, and by visiting the villages, and he's actually constructed the vision how rurals are very important. On top of this, while listening to him, it is very fascinating that you know, he brings different subjects within the social sciences. He talks about the economy, he talks about the sociology, anthropology, and also on top of that, the methods from the research methodology point of view. I think the, the entire lecture covers the whole multidisciplinary perspective of the social sciences. So with this, I now invite the D on A, maybe 15 to 20 minutes we spent. It's open for the questions and answers. My uh, question to you was that, uh, since your lecture questions a lot of the definitions and ideas that we connect with village, because we assume that village is primarily where agrarian occupation takes place. Everything else is urban or an outlier. So in your, in your view, what would be the elements of a new and particularly India specific definition or definitions of villages. What would be the characteristics of such a new definition, which your lecture suggests that we need? See, I don't want to again formally give a definition of village. Right? I know, I know, I, I'll come to it. <laughs> right? The point is that first of all, you should, when you visit a settlement, we need to empirically map spatial formations. So if there are five different kinds of spatial formations, for example, urban administrators know that cities are different. Like in Delhi, we have a category called urban village. We have a category called rural village. We have likewise, you know, five, six different classifications that urban policy makers make in order to introduce policies because they know one thing that works in Vasantviyar will not work in Vasantkun, but works in Vasantkun will not work in Munirka, right? So these are different kinds of spatial formations. So first, I think that the starting point should be obviously some kind of hypothesis as we do in social sciences, but we should be willing to map spatial formations and then give them characters, right? For example, in terms of occupations, you said, lots of people in villages around Hyderabad or wherever you go, wherever the city is not very far, so lots of people stay in villages and work in the city and villages become slums. They are still villages. But far off village would be different. So the point that I would like to make is that we need to open it up. Right? 
So obviously, but not only villages, also cities. So we need to have a different imagination of spatial formations, which would be based on empirical features. You can have economy, you can have social relations, you can have kinship patterns, you can have identities, you can identify five, six, seven different kind of uh, uh, variable sets and then you can have classification so that it makes sense. So I don't want to, I'm not a policy maker, but the point is that existing classification is mistaken and it is hegemonic. It produces more problems than solutions and that itself. And that's what I'm saying. The need is to be empirical rather than to be, to be judgmental. So, as you said that the national common sense uh, is shaped by the middle class. So, but like for example, Sanjay Srivastava, he says that in his field work, almost 90% of the people he met from a driver uh, and from an Ola, Ola driver to an A-grade officer in, in, uh, in bureaucracy. Everybody categorizes themselves as or calls themselves uh, middle class. Then how do we like conceptualize this or how do we see this? Because it is so variable. So I say middle class is produced by nationalist imagination. So there is a particular way in which a nationalist leadership, I am talking about middle class, nationalist leadership in some sense constructs the idea of India as a singular political community. In that singular political community, development becomes the imperative. And development becoming the imperative means everyone has to become urban and come into the... so And that's where your auto driver is located. So the moment you move out, when I was doing my field work in, in Bihar, I remember no, this driver who used to take me around. He was working 12 hours, 18 hours so that he can send his child to an English medium school. So that normative is... That's why I use the word hegemon. It's not something that is away from me. Everyone is embedded in the same narrative. But nevertheless, it's a narrative. It's not something which is actually... So we all want to be middle class. Everyone, if you go around, people who are slightly urban connected, farmers, for example, the biggest crisis of agriculture is that younger generation wants to be middle class. And even though demographically, we don't have more than 50 to 20 or maybe 30 percent population as middle class, classifiable even from an economic perspective, but middle class has become a moral majority, is what we argue in another small book we published. So this moral majority means that middle, middle class narrative has become hegemonic. Everyone wants to be in this modern space. And that modern space also has its own history. And it in some sense also becomes then a judgmental which in some sense enslaves us through those narratives. So that is the argument I am trying to make. Good afternoon sir. Thank you for the lecture. Actually my question was that uh, when you said even the modern leaders like Gandhi and Nehru accepted this whole oriental project of drawing a binary between the village and the city. Uh, was it a part of a, was it intended or was it just a part of their ignorance? Because if it was intend, intended, uh, what were the political benefits of it? It's both in some sense. Uh, political benefit is that you are able to produce an India, an imagination of India, which is actually very different. So they want to make an argument to the colonial rulers that there is something called India and we want independence and I should be the leader of that country. Right? So they would say, how can you say you are the leader? What language, what region do you come from? Right. So they would transcend themselves that there is something called one India and that India is inscribed in your own texts. When you talk about India in your book view of India, then India is the land of caste, land of villages, land of Hindus. Right. So that India then becomes the nation state called India. Right. But actual reality is very different. Right. Caste formations are very significantly different from region to region. We don't have Kambas and Reddis in Punjab. Right. We don't have the kind of communities you have in Himachal Pradesh in, in, in Gujarat. So we don't have, you know, Nayars and Namudris are in Kerala and not anywhere else. So they are not just caste groups. The Budri Brahmin will have nothing to do with, the, with an Ayer and a Yengar, even if they are living in the same village. These are two different kinds of social formation. But how do you similarize them? So in the process, you are trying to produce an imagination of India through these categories. So these categories, perhaps they also believed in it. We also perhaps accepted it. And that created many problems at that time. Partition was one of them. Right? But also the way we understand caste today, empirically the way policy makers we need to say, then you have to make lists of communities. Every region has separate list of scheduled castes and OVCs. There is not one single hierarchy. But yes, Varna functions as an ideological category at the national level. 
not only in relation to the manner in which nation state is imagined it doesn't include pakistan why doesn't it include pakistan it doesn't include bangladesh it was also part of the same south asian sub region that that that, that, that colonial rulers imagined through those narratives so this is a kind of very recent history and we should approach it as it is these were construct which were normalized as features of india at a particular moment in history by certain agents and those agents were the nationalist leadership but more than that the nationalist middle class so was it intentional of course at some level it was intentional developmental bureaucracy acquired that hegemonic power over entire country over rural people that we know what is good for you and then it gets translated into policies niti ayog or planning commission can make policies and say that we are educated people we know what is good for everyone else so that is where i think the problem lies yes i i uh, just noticed you used empirical versus judgmental in and then you are privileging empirical over what you are calling judgment uh, i don't know what is judgmental here you know because in fact everything would be judgment even the perception of any reality would be judgmental always some kind of framework some kind of filter we all used to perceive so there is nothing like reality out there which is neat and clean and you know uh, not not uh, viewed from any particular perspective secondly i think these various differences that were pointed out are ideological contradictions within the society right so different segments of society will produce different ideological constructs it's true that some will be hegemonic right but then there are also like when you talk about farmers movement there, there are protests right there is uh, a counter narrative that emerges so one would like to see it's not that this is right and that is wrong it is an evolution and reality keeps changing evolving anyways and we will keep producing perspectives or ideological constructs and they will be contradictory not always so the point i'm trying to make is that there are certain hegemonic ideas which we all internalize right the point that i'm making about empirical empirical is precisely what you're doing to me right empirical is available for criticism empirical is available for question to be able to criticize the nationalist common sense you need to be a full lecture and that also doesn't work so there are historically produced notions of say the moment feminists brought in question of gender that sex and gender biological differences and and gender constitution were different things it opens up your imagination to new questions no one is saying that the new empirical would be quote unquote neutral there can't be anything neutral human sciences can't be neutral they should not be neutral neutral against whom we are all located in the european project of in some sense enlightenment in some way or the other right so even the critics of enlightenment are located in the same project right we don't want to go back to you know that's not possible so everyone is talking about a new kind of human relational structures where there is more humanity there is more equality so that is the point i'm trying to make so there are institutionalized hierarchies which get structured in textbooks and that are not criticized that are not that are not questioned and they become part of the common sense and the common sense appears to be in some sense obviously authentic and rustic why should you question the common sense so i think the question in common sense i think we need to have much more <laughs> critical understanding of common sense and common sense as a subject hasn't emerged as as a subject of study in india but i think we need to do much more in our habits if we want to think of you know everything is value based and we all in some sense sciences social sciences everyone is in some sense engaged university is engaged in the production of a new social which is more human and equal right so in that context there are certain questions that become relevant questions certain questions not become relevant questions so yes so one can say that yeah that is also narrative which is also narrative but that's not really the point the point is that we are in some sense pursuing the common objective as i said i am not a traditionalist i am also embedded in the same project social science is also embedded in the same project but they need to self criticize to be able to identify those problems which have been institutionalized as if they are 
naturalized normal dreams. Thank you, Professor, for that very enlightening lecture. Uh, so, I'd like you to give your insights into the practice of uh, sociologists, how they function and how were they so readily, uh, you know, sort of absorbing the, the colonial way of looking at India. How, how was it that they were not questioning it at that time? In fact, post-independent cinema was probably looking at reality a little more uh, clearly. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of Dobi Ghazami, where the city is not romanticized, you know. So, uh, yeah, so these are some of my questions. I think that's a very important question. Uh, so, uh, see, M.N. Shirinivas is trained in Oxford. S.C. Dubey is also trained, I think, in some European university and he comes back. So, there's a particular imagination of India that enters global social sciences. So, even somebody like A.R. Desai, when he's writing social background to Indian nationalism, he reproduces the classical colonial Marxist and Marxian understanding of, 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 of Indian agriculture. I mean, he could have just gone to a village and seen for himself how private property functioned. Many documents would have shown him. He didn't look at documents. He just read Marx and said, yeah, this is what India was. But that's, that's the problem, you know. All of them kind of, at some level, there is also embedded Brahminism, elitism in social sciences, which was much more at that time. The kind of question that he was saying and the kind of point that we are making that we need to debate and engage and critically engage with received wisdoms. So the received wisdom of social science was also evolutionist. Economics is one subject which is still working very comfortably with development theories. They don't talk about colonial plunder when they are discussing development in classroom, even today. Ask any economics textbook, look at any, most of the economics department, rarely somebody will talk about economic history of economy. But otherwise, all theories of economic growth and development will still lie, be embedded in the same evolutionist notion of developed countries, underdeveloped countries, developing countries. And the idea of developing countries presupposes certain kind of realities. Europe in, 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 in 19th century or early 19th century was not much better than India. China in 1990 and India in 1990 had same, I think China had higher poverty than India had. In 1990, just 30 years back, or 35 years back, right? And last 35 years, China has gone somewhere else. India still has very high poverty rate. China, there's nobody who's poor if you look at the national income. So we can see our economic history. Economic histories are made by the state, by actors, by leaders, by other processes, global processes, right? They are not inevitable in the, the, the theory. So I think the answer lies in the way global academy was. But they're also engaging. When I mentioned was is looking at the reality, book view field view is his own original contribution. But again, he is stuck with the village. India is land of villages. S.C. Dubey is stuck with the village. Doesn't look at Telangana, Hyderabad as, as, as India. Yeah, I am not from uh, social science, but I come from chemistry. But I just had this uh, small uh, clarification. Uh, you know, you said you don't want to define a village. But at the same time, uh, the general impression is that village is, uh, you know, centered around agrarian system, right? But uh, apart from the people who are working in the farms, there are people who are doing related things like poultry, you know, uh, the uh, dairy, and then the blacksmith, the carpenter, all these guys who make tools required for uh, the, the, the farming, etc. So it makes a, you know, a kind of self-sufficient system. And I think you also mentioned about Gandhi. And he always said that, if I remember correctly, um, he said a village should be self-sufficient. Try to make, you know, things which are, um, consist, consist of things which make them self-sufficient so that, you know, the system runs. Uh, so could you comment on that? Thank you very much for asking that question. Actually, I have a section in my book precisely on this point. Uh, cobbler, think of a cobbler as a cobbler, right? Part of the system. But any good cobbler in India was an engineer. Now we have departments of leather engineering. So a person who is producing shoes, making shoes, he was also a trader. And actually, people who were engaged in co this cobbler work, they have been very enterprising. So they always had a global market. So where did they procure the leather from? Not just from the local market. They were cobbler. We have not studied that history of Indian technologies. 
a cobbler in a village of Hatya could be trading all over the world. And they were actually reality. The person who was producing spices in Kerala, and this is an old history, you know, spice trade was happening all over the world. So villages, historically, those people who were either engaged in agriculture and non-farm occupations, they were already trading. They were not confined to the village. Right? People, if 17-18% were living in, in towns, where were they getting their, their pots from? Those pots were coming from villages, from potters. Today also pots are produced in the villages, but they are sold in the cities and the villagers buy their plastic matkas of the city, right? So this notion is itself is a part of the same imagination which colonial rulers want to produce and then Gandhi in some sense normalizes it. The point that I'm trying to make is that in India, you never had a community. Potters did not supply pots only to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to their jajmans. So the word <laughs> jajmani, there's a paper in our chapter, in book, uh, Handbook of Caste, is a Peter Muir, an anthropological historian from Australia, and he argues that this idea of Jedmani is actually a late 19th century idea, and it is confined only to North India. The Jedmani did not exist as we imagine it existed always, and he shows a lot of historical evidence to show. So this whole idea of integrated village community is a misnomer. Even in Telangana, I know there are there are villages which are a single caste village. So there are many other villages which are multi-caste villages. So there are villages where there would be two castes or villages there are you know, other kind of fishery villages. So there were diversities of rural settlements and these settlements, as I said, city was the center around which those settlements were integrated. They always had something to do with the city, not only pilgrimage, not only land revenue, but they were actively reproduced. That's how we had one language. Every region had a language. So if village was isolated, then every village would have a separate language. We have village exogam. You are not supposed to marry within the village. People married outside. So agriculture, historically speaking, lots of economists would say agriculture by definition is an urban economy. The moment you have agriculture, there would be surplus production and that surplus production will be taken out of village. It would travel globally. When does tomato come to India? Where does potato come to India? It was not produced here. Precisely. So the, the dynamics of agriculture, and I've quoted David Ludden at length, how in the 15th, 16th century in North, Northwest India, communities were moving from one region to the other. They were setting up new regions, new agricultural practices, technologies were traveling from one place to the other. So this kind of notion takes us back to a self-sufficient, stagnant village, which stayed stable forever until the Britishers came and introduced technology. Indian villages were technologically very sophisticated. Those people who were, were talking about blacksmiths. Blacksmithry requires lots of technological inputs. You cannot just put it on the village level. They would have to import some kind of iron from outside. Where did they get that from? How did they get that from? They needed to have cash. So the moment you begin to rewrite these histories, then you have to, we have no history of blacksmithry in India. How did it progress? Where did iron come from? What were the dynamics in different regions? How did they trade? How far did they go? If you are making those kind of, you know, uh, things to cut wood, where did they export? Everyone would not sell those things in the village. So these were, I think, very sophisticated businesses and trades and technologies, which we have not taken seriously. And actually, in the modern times, we degraded them to menial occupations rather than kind of dignified them and upgrading them. The modern engineering this upgradation of the of the of the Western technical occupation, which could have evolved there over a period of time. So here we kind of then need to go to IIT to become an engineer, but then engineers don't do engineering, they become managers. <laughs> the problem that very serious problem in India higher education. You just added point. I didn't mean to say that the village is completely I'm saying those connections were there in cities also. But urban settlement also had the same connection. Yeah. So that, that's the point. I mean, every region had its own histories. Yeah, you were uh, talking about uh, spatial imaginations and uh, the binary constructs, the village and the city and so on that uh, served the colonial project. Uh, Another sort of very annoying uh, concept that uh, keeps popping up in popular discourse uh, 
perhaps as a result of uh, the developmental state that you talked about, is this idea of a remote village. Uh, I always wonder, has there ever been a remote village? And uh, what do you think of uh, such a thing today? I mean, is there I'm such a thing as a remote village? It seems to justify <laughs> some kind of an internal colonial project now. You know, an expansionist capital and, and so on. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the two things. One is precisely what you just said. But at another level, when we were talking about classif classifying spatial formations, I think uh, it, it does make a sense to identify those settlements which are particular. integrated in the larger market in a particular manner. Others are integrated in a particular manner. So the moment you have a settled agriculture, it's no more longer going to be removed, right? But uh, again, over a period of time, things have changed. Now, even within cities, you would travel 40 kilometers just to go to your work and then you're staying in the same city, right? So earlier, even going 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers would have taken you 5, 6 hours to walk or some other kind of, you know, pull a cart or something like that. So obviously with time, uh, again, it's also one has to, when we're talking about space, space is very closely connected with, with, with time, you know, space, time, compression and stuff like that. So I think with globalization, the word globalization becomes very useful in the manner in which social science is defined in uh, time, space, compression. Like these people who are moving from Delhi to a village in, 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 in Madhya Pradesh, 20 kilometers from Bhopal. So they are not going anywhere. They are still living in village, uh, in Delhi. It's just that you are like multi-sighted as, as a person. Your economies are multi-sighted. And this is a new reality. Where many people are multi-sighted. So again, when we talk about spatial formations, so multi-sighted living is also a kind of living. When you simultaneously, at single moment, you are living at three, four different places through your mobile phone, through your different technologies, you are working there, you are doing business here. Just your physical body is at one place, but otherwise, in terms of economic life, you are multi-sided. And these are these are new reality. These are not just just kind of you know happening to just global middle class. This is perhaps happening to kind of many people at different levels. Uh, so uh, my question emerges from this powerful statement that you made, which is how empirical can challenge certain notions that we carry, or we may form. Uh, so the person who is doing this empirical research is the researcher. And in sociology, we debate at length about the position of researcher. And especially in the context of village studies, uh, the urban researcher having an urban-centric approach coming to villages and studying villages. Now, I do not know about uh, your location uh, in that as a researcher when you did your field work. Uh, however, when you also spoke that how rural is diverse and every village is completely different from any other village, uh, will that dissolve actually the insider-outsider binary? So again, very important question. The point is that uh, at present, we raise these questions. The moment we raise these questions, they become part of our communication strategies. And in our communication strategies, we need to unearth our identities. I also have identity. I had identities when I was visiting that. But at the same time, I think we should not be reducing everything to location. If that was the case, then we can't do, we can't communicate with each other. Right? I can only tell my personal autobiographical stories in an authentic manner, but that also might be shaped by another person sitting next to me and uh, the context, if I'm talking to you, I'll speak in a particular manner. When I'm speaking to my son, I'll speak in a very different manner. So one needs to obviously recognize the challenges of human communication. Right? But at the same time, we have these questions and this lecture is part of the same. But I personally feel that to say that we have locations and we have our own identities does not make empiric redundant. If we need to talk about the larger world, we are connected. We are not, we are not, that's what makes us what we are. That's also a relational process of our becoming male. But the moment I say that I am a male and not the man, then I redefine myself. So my masculinity becomes a source through which I have to overcome that or I have to take that 
as 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 part of my communication when I'm talking to you or when we are talking to each other, and if I was talking to Sneha, it would be very different kind of, you know, give and take in some sense. So I think uh, that is it's part of that that we need to open up these questions. As I said, feminists opened up these questions of gender, and that made things different to some extent. Not that it changed the relational structures, but at the same time, it made us. Less guilty of our locations or our relations or stuff, whatever like that. Or it made it makes a new kind of politics available to us. So I think this is also politics. What I am doing is also politics. It's not like not politics. So then that doesn't mean that that farmer does not exist or the cobbler doesn't exist or the, or the, the, the Gandhi also becomes then empirical. Gandhi doesn't become in some sense the truth. The moment we reduce Gandhi to empirical, then we can ask questions. And then we can decide for ourselves. That's the only answer I have. Hello, sir. Thank you for uh, this wonderful talk. And I want to tell you that I am from biological sciences, and that's why I have a different question. Uh, I was wondering because you have done a lot of research on villages, and that's why I was wondering if you have ever tried or noticed any trend uh, about the scientific education and the uh, science communication in the villages. Uh, I don't find any difference between rural people and urban people. I find urban people to be as illiterate when it comes to scientific discussions and questions. Rural people to be as enlightened as anyone else. Is. Honestly, I mean, it's it's actually a very interesting question, but that's the point I'm trying to make. So in urban, also people who are PhDs, who are doctors, who are scientists, who are philosophers, and interpersonal relations when they're talking about their children, their relationships, they will be. As silly as anyone else. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Uh, my question is uh, especially in uh, yeah, yeah. Com community, in uh, communities, uh, in form of communities. If uh, you said, sir, an SC community person in Haryana is different from Tamil Nadu, same condition with OBC people is different in Punjab and different in UP. In uh, village species uh, there is very less species for the scheduled caste and the underprivileged peoples but urban species give them space in the form of modernization of institutions can you little elaborate with the coming of britishers institutions yeah it's a very difficult question to answer it says it needs a lot of discussion uh, i completely agree with you as I said, spatial formations are very critical social empirical realities. Right? Those spatial formations also make us as we become, as men, women, as caste, as religious persons. It's not like I'm saying spatial formations are irrelevant. If you are living in a small, tiny village, there are there are only twenty households. Everyone knows everyone else. If a woman gets pregnant, the whole community will know about it. Right? But if you go to a Bihar village, 70% people would not recognize each other. And this is something that was reported by a survey. Because villages are very big and everyone is mobile, traveling. So anonymity does come with density of population, there is no doubt about it. Urban provides you different space, anonymity, no doubt about it. Right? I don't, don't disagree with that. But the point I was making, historically the idea of casteism, Casteism means that you know all these people belong to my caste even though I have nothing to do with them. They are not my relatives, but this person is also from the same caste as I am. Therefore, we should be together. This is something which emerges in India in the late 19th century, urban India, when the British introduced secular education and these communities are sending their children to colleges and schools to study. The first thing they do is to have a separate place where their children can stay. So they begin to form caste associations. They begin to set up hostels. It happens actually more in the in the in the big cities like Bombay, Madras. I don't know if it was also happening in Hyderabad. So if you look at the history of caste associations, pardon? yeah. So history of caste associations, and when you have caste mobilizations, that all of us belong to one caste and we should vote for X community as X candidate. The fountainhead of it is city, not village. It doesn't happen. It's the mobile middle class individuals coming, educated individuals coming from those caste communities that mobilize themselves. 
So that's the point I'm making. To think of city as caste-free and village as casted. Of course, there are different ways in which caste operates there. In urban areas, you can you can pass much more easily, right? But not beyond a point. And I was doing my work on uh, the Dalit entrepreneurs in, in a town called Panipat. And there was one family which had come from Rajasthan and they started their business. So the business was functioning fine and nobody knew them who they were. And finally, the children grew up and they wanted to marry them. And when they began to look for marriage alliances in the local community, they had moved away from their state and 20 years back they had not gone and they, were, they perhaps were asked to leave the village or whatever. So they didn't know what to do. They had to declare discourse their identity. Nobody will trust them. If they say we are we are Khatris, no one will believe them. Khatris, which kind of Khatris? Bring some relative. There you have to expose your caste. So in urban India, wherever age marriage happens, 100% if not at least 99%, I think 100%. Happens through certain kind of kinship networks. And those kinship networks will ex expose your caste. So caste is not absent in urban. That's the only point I should make. Uh, sir, when you are uh, challenging the judgmental understanding of Indian villages and proposing the empirical understanding of the villages, uh, are you opening the door for future researcher uh, to propose? Unlimited understanding of it is like the feminist proposed universal idea of the feminism. Uh, I mean, which was a uh, universal idea of feminism earlier? Uh, current feminist proposed as an unlimited understanding of feminism. Something like that. Are you proposing the unlimited understanding of the Indian villages against the uh, judgmental view of it is? I think in methodology, we make a distinction between empirical and empiricist. Right? So I am not empiricist. I am empirical. What direction you want to take it, I don't know. And again, feminism is, is very sophisticated, philosophical, theoretical domain now. I am not familiar with everything. right? Uh, so, but I, as a social scientist, I would say contested empirical. Right? It doesn't mean that if I say this is right, you should accept this is right. If five people saying, yeah, all these, then again, you should examine our assumptions. So that is the point. That it should always be open to questioning. It should not become part of our common sense. The moment a category becomes common sense, that becomes hegemonic and ideological. That is the idea. Right? So that's the direction I would like to take. That It's not like this is final thing and it has been like in a lab tested and therefore it is final. I don't think human relationships are ever going to be finalized. So that's the excitement about social sciences. That's why we need to be much more imaginative and much more critical. So that's where the word sociological imagination, historical imagination comes from. So the word imagination is very critical for me. And these imaginations have to be critically engaged imaginations. And then obviously every generation will, will explore it because the reality is also changed. We are all socially constructed. We are not, we are not stagnant. We are not stable. We are not Done for all. Dean is dean today, tomorrow he may not be dean, might become vice chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> what is the part of nice? Second word, nice sir. So, um, you alluded to um, how there is a lack of community in the Indian context, but um, and at the same time, um, you also talk about uh, how one shouldn't essentialize on. Um, spatial categories like the village and the city. So, my question is a bit more general. Um, how uh, do you as a sociologist make sense of this idea of a community when moving beyond these um, spatial categories of the village and the city? Most sociologists don't use the word community any longer in social sciences. I right? think community has gone out of fashion. Yes, um, there is community radio. <laughs> the word community does, does come up in some way or the other. But I think it's more like a kind of common language. But yes, there is a particular way in which the word community is invoked by, say, sociology and anthropology as the other of society. There is an associational collective and there is a communitarian collective. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even those who would earlier talk about communities, say, for example, even something like tribal community, People say, no, no, there is nothing called homogeneous type of community. There are also differences. So I think uh, the word community was used, 
until 50s, 60s, and 70s, quite a bit. It's much lesser now. But yes, communities are mobilized now. It's like that uh, British black uh, Marxist, uh, uh, Stuart Hall, how communities are always mobilized. Communities are not, not pre given, communities are not soon generous. Communities have to be mobilized and become member of a particular community, a particular movement because, because of a certain kind of political process rather than kind of thinking evolutionary uh, in, a, in an evolutionary frame as, as being primitive, as being pre modern, as community and modern as not. Thank you. Yeah, before I uh, request uh, Dr. Sala to propose a vote of thanks, a small announcement from our dean side. And as uh, we actually prized him during the, you know, vice chancellor actually prized him as a part of that. Most of us doesn't know that he also created a YouTube channel for the School of Social Sciences and also Twitter account, where we are going to post and upload all our videos, not only school activities but also coming days. The academic unit activities also. Therefore, the small request from the school side is that you know every student and faculty, if you subscribe the YouTube channel of the School of Social Sciences and Twitter account, the school and also the different academic units within the school. Thank you. Now I request uh, Salah to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, on behalf of the School of Social Sciences, uh, first of all, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to the esteemed Chief Guest, Vice Chancellor Professor Vijay Rao, who since had full thoughts in this occasion and reached our understanding. He has been a constant source of encouragement for events organized by School of Social Sciences in the recent past, and his presence is always a delight. Our heartfelt thanks also go to the Guest of Honor, Professor Ganesham. Krishna, director of IOE, for his generous, generous support. IOE's uh, support has been uh, has been instrumental in bringing this lecture series. Uh, we are truly grateful for the ongoing collaboration between IOE and Social Sciences, uh, uh, as it has facilitated a lot of projects and events in the School of Social Sciences in the recent past. Uh, I express uh, sincere gratitude to our Dean, School of Social Science, Professor Jyoti Mahi Sharma whose tireless efforts culminate in such academically enriching events in, in the school. He has always been particularly keen on initiating such events. For example, we just inaugurated the <coughs> time lecture series last week and Vice Chancellor was the inaugural speaker. And uh, more importantly, I express profound uh, appreciation to our speaker, Professor Surindra Sriyotkara, for gracing this event with his August presence and a very illuminating uh, lecture. It is always truly enlightening to hear his thoughts and insights that surely provoke us to provoke us to think beyond the conventional uh, readings. We are really grateful to you for uh, coming over here and making this uh, event possible. Uh, a special uh, commendation is extended to Professor uh, V. C. Rao at Center for Regional Studies for chairing this event and carrying out the proceedings. I would like to acknowledge the dedicated efforts of the uh, student volunteers, uh, Satyagi, Rachat, Ranjit, Divya, and, and Devashida, and sorry if I have forgotten any name, and the office staff of CRS and Dean's office who work behind the scene to ensure the smooth ex execution of the event. A deep sense of gratitude is extended to staff taking care of the uh, Sivira and Auditorium who made sure that this event is conducted successfully. Uh, to our friends, colleagues, and students, thank you so much for uh, your active participation and enthusiasm uh, throughout. Your engagement has made this event, uh, event uh, this gathering vibrant and dynamic. Once again, thank you all for being part of this remarkable event. Uh, we look forward to your continued support, support and participation in the future. Thank you all. Thank you very much from my side for staying on. I was really impressed. And Touch the all is still back. Uh, I've always seen scientists in this room along with social scientists. And I'm so happy that you know there are people from sciences there, including our vice chancellor, Dr. Swami, and some students as well. Thank you once again from the bottom of my heart.